If you watched or listened to our recent podcast on five reasons not to buy a boat, but you decided to ignore all the advice that we <laughs> gave and you're going ahead and you're going to buy one anyway, this podcast and the next one is for you. Yes, this is how to buy your first boat, part one. We've got so much to tell you that we had to split it into two. So part one today yes. is, oh, before we go ahead with that, we need to explain that what kind of boat we're talking about. Yeah, so I think actually, having gone through our notes, yeah. this does really apply to any boat, I suppose. Yeah, it does, it really does. It's about honing your choice, understanding what it is you're going to be doing and what you need to do, what you plan to do. So really, we're talking sailboats, that's for sure. And really, we're aiming at liveaboard cruising boats, but as you say, it's every boat. Yeah, I mean, we're talking about liveable cruisers. Obviously, yeah. that is our own experience. We've been doing this for almost two decades now, so yeah. we feel like we know a little bit on the subject. But I do think some of the rules and ideas and themes that we're going to go through kind of applies to any any boat. So Yeah. So do you want to explain what a liveable cruiser is? Well, I mean, it, it, that's an interesting one because mm. in, the, in, the, in the UK, at least, we call ourselves liverboards. Mm. And I think in the States they say cruisers because liverboard has a slightly different connotation, doesn't it? It sort of conjures up ideas of people on houseboats tied up in a river, never moving. Yeah, we are talking about boats that go places. So you live on it, it is your home, but you are going to be cruising. Where you cruise and how much cruising you're going to do does affect your choice of boat, we believe, quite a lot. But you're going to be living on this boat. It might only be for a year, it might be, as Jamie says, for two decades like us. However long it is, it's still all of the same rules apply, I think. I think so. Mm. Yeah, well, we'll find out. We've got loads to get through. So I think a little caveat, by the way, these are not hard and fast rules. <laughs> these are really just our, our own personal observations and ideas, which you can either apply or not apply to your own decision making process. Yeah, so you won't be thrown in jail if you don't follow our rules. <laughs> just a bit. But before we start, can I ask you, what is the best boat? Hello, I'm Liz. And I'm Jamie. Welcome to Follow the Boat, in which we discuss what it's really like to give it all up to live on a boat. And go travelling around the world. We've been doing it since 2006, and we're still at it. Each week we talk about our latest YouTube videos. And about boats, sailing, travel, or anything else which floats into our heads. And if you leave a comment we like, we'll give you an answer and a name check. Peace, Peace and, and fair, fair winds. winds. <laughs> <laughs> get that ask that question so much people who, who have not sailed before perhaps and new sailors what's the best boat for liverpool cruising it's like when i go to camera forums people asking what's the best camera there are so many variations caveats there's there's lots of things to think about when thinking about a boat and and invariably of course there is no such thing as the perfect boat and that is because guaranteed you will have to make compromises yes yes and guaranteed you will not be wanting the same thing from your boat as the next fella or woman so it's very much there is a perfect boat for you out there we're going to show you how to try and find it but there isn't one generic perfect boat so what we're going to be asking you to think about in this video podcast are a number of things to get a perspective on before you start looking. So we're going to look at the whole type, the rig style, the layout, the depth, the keel, uh, the construction and the engine, even though we're talking sailing boats. Yes, but don't forget this is a podcast split into two halves. So in the second half, we're going to be talking about actually going out and looking for boats, eventually putting in an offer, buying and the whole sort of monetary side of things as well. So. Yeah. So let's get on with part one. OK. Um, first thing that we uh, looked at was there. we think there are two questions you need to ask yourself to actually make the honing and decision making easier. And they are what you need to know before you buy your first sailboat and what you need to know when you're buying your first sailboat. In fact, no, that's part one and part two, isn't it? That's what I just said, isn't it? <laughs> Not listening to you as usual. Never does. Yeah, so before you start your shopping, <laughs> there are two questions that you need to ask yourself. Where will you be sailing, number one? And who will you be sailing with, number two? Yes. And as we said, I think the obvious question people will be asking is, but what about budget? We'll talk about budget later. Yeah. As, as you say, this is before you even start going out and looking at boats in, yeah. in real life. These are the two questions that you need to think about. Yeah. 
fire away then. Well, the first thing is where will you be sailing? So we're talking about liveaboard cruisers. Now that can be someone who stays in the same area and does a little bit of day sailing, a bit of coastal hopping, or it can be like us. You can be going across blue water, going over oceans, going around the world. Some people go around the world twice in a year. <laughs> Some people take 10 years to do it. But a blue water cruiser, cruising boat, needs to be able to get across an ocean safely and comfortably. Mm -hmm. So what do we think about blue water cruisers? How can we explain them and what do you look for? Well, OK, so the, I think the first thing we should say is, by the way, again, these are not hard and fast rules. So lots of blue water cruisers are found coastal cruising and day hopping and lots of lightweight, what we call production line boats can be found circumnavigating. Yeah. So should make that clear as well. But a blue water cruiser, they tend to be much heavier boats. Um, more often than not, there'll be a monohull versus a catamaran. Uh, because they have a heavy displacement, it just allows them to manage heavier weather that much easier, I suppose. Yeah, they're much more comfortable in big weather, in gales and big waves. Um, that's what they're designed for. They're designed to tackle those with a reasonable modicum of comfort because those that weather is bad whatever boat you're in but they will they will comfortably go through those waves they're designed to do that and all that weight you've got below um, and all that space you've got around you to hold on to and the and the construction and everything makes it a lot easier so yeah so the weight they are generally much heavier mm. boats um, I think you also find in terms of handling they're perhaps yeah. designed more to be handled either by shorthanded as in one a solo sailor or a couple and quite often from the cockpit as well so this could mean things like um, uh, smaller sails so for example on our boat we have what you call a Yankee which is a very high cut sail and that is because we are cutter rig so we have a stay sail yes that's our four sail the yankee yeah, yeah so it, it, effectively you know rather than 130 150 percent genoa at the front with just one sail we have two shorter sails it is much easier to handle in heavier weather yes and we've got two masts uh, two masts as well, of course, yes. But it, it, also the handling can apply perhaps to the way that the lines are brought back to the cockpit. Mm. Now, the cockpit's a key feature, I think, with a lot of, not all, but a lot of blue water cruising boats, and that is the cockpit will be in the centre as opposed to at the back of the boat. Mm. Um, there's a number of reasons for this. The first, of course, is that it makes your boat look smaller. <laughs> It's not so frightening as you look up the front as these huge waves are coming at you. Um, it, obviously, it's at the centre of the boat, which is where you're going to be the most stable as mm. well. Um, it also means that lines both fore and aft can be taken to the centre of the boat as opposed to running all the way to the back of the boat. Mm. And you tend to find that centre cockpits have smaller cockpits and they are much more enclosed. So they give a feeling of safety as opposed to a big wide cockpit at the back of the boat. Yes, it, that feeling of safety, for me, I love. I love that side of it. Mm. Um, they're also very good. They need to be protected, those cockpits, in bad weather. We sailed in bad weather before we put this great big, uh, what do you call it, the, da the... Dodger. The Dodger. Before we put our big Dodger on, we had an open cockpit and it was like having the sea chucked in your face 24-7. It was pretty horrible. So if you're going to do any big any big stuff if you're going to be any bad weather you really need to enclose that dodger somehow it doesn't have to be a hard dodger like this it can be canvas but uh, any blue water sailor will tell you you need to keep dry as much as you can and keep the boat dry i mean when we first bought esper all she had was a in fact she didn't even have a bimini she no. literally had a spray hook yeah. and we found in the turkish hot summers which would hit well over 40 degrees mm. uh, we'd just fry yeah so the first thing we put on was a bimini but eventually we found when we started hitting the winters and also heavier weather it just meant we were constantly soaked now when you're looking for a boat of course it may not have these features but don't forget of course you can retrofit these but yeah. that will impact perhaps on how much you're going to spend on the boat versus what you're going to keep aside afterwards to to modify the boat mm. talk about that in the next one mm. but yeah so think about all these things it's it's very much the uh, blue water boat is very much a defensive boat so you're working on a boat you're, you're looking for a boat that's going to shield you and help you through the worst situations if you're not going to be planning on being in those kind of situations, if you're not going to do any blue water sailing and you want a coastal cruising boat, whole different ballgame.
So what do you mean by coastal cruising then? Well, you know, if you're going to, if, for instance, we've been here in, in um, Southeast Asia for nearly 10 years now, so we haven't done any big blue water. We've been across the seas and we've done a few overnighters and whatnot, but we haven't done any really big crossings for 10 years. So you could say in, in some respects that we've been coastal cruising in mm. Southeast Asia. Um, before that, we were in the Med, so a lot of boats in the Med and they cruise around the Med. It's a fantastic cruising ground. There's great winds and there's lots of places to see there. Caribbean, obviously a lot of people go from the US to the Caribbean. There's the bit we've got to get there. But you can shorten that, and with the good weather prediction these days, there's no reason why you need to be going through any, any bad weather to get there. So I would call that coastal cruising. Yes. I, I, I mean, I would define coastal cruising as day hopping. OK, so you're, not, you're saying no overnighters at all? Well, I mean, obviously, overnighters are invariable. They are going to happen when you have to jump between islands, for example. Yes. But I think on the whole, you're not looking at crossing the Atlantic or the Pacific no. or the Indian Ocean. You are going to base yourselves locally. You may even have a base, like a, you may be based in a marina. Yeah, and some that people is do that. definitely going to impact uh, on, on the boat and all the features it has on the boat. But yeah, looking at um, what we, we're going to call them production line boats. Just are they, These are lighter displacement boats. Have you got any examples right, so that people know what you're talking about? Benetos, right. Bavarias, Genos. Odysseys, Genos, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, and you'll find that they are quite different boats. Quite often, a new buyer, when they're looking at the same length boat and they're comparing a blue water cruiser with a lighter production boat, I think the most obvious thing is the feeling of space that you get from a production line boat. Yeah, I mean, they are fantastic. They usually don't have centre cockpits. They're usually at the back and they're usually huge. So they're really good for entertaining. Um, massive space out there, very different to ours here. We can seat four people for lunch, maybe. If we feel like it. Yeah, but on those you can get these great big tables and, and fabulous parties to be had. Mm. <laughs> and not just the cockpit, of course, down below you'll find... I'm going to give a quick example of it. We looked at a Feeling 1350, which I think was a Ron Holland design. It was. It, it, it's classified as a racer cruiser. Um, we took it out for a test sail and we were hitting 10 knots easily and we were overtaking all the other boats uh, that day, weren't we? Um, and the first, my, my main memory of this boat is going down below and walking into the saloon, how cavernous it was. It was enormous. And as a newbie, uh, you're, you kind of think, well, this is amazing, isn't it? Look at all this space. I loved it. I thought, wow. It's like being in an apartment. Mm. Great big sofas, a nice open plan galley. They had their cabin at the front and two cabins at the back, both double, so they could sleep six people easily. It was 46 foot, I think. 13, 50s, yeah, it's about 46 yeah, foot. Yeah, a little couple of feet longer than Esper. Something like that. But felt so much bigger than yes. Esper. Yes, but of course, um, the, the trade off with that is that. One way in which they make these boats feel more spacious is that they minimise on the storage. So you'll find on uh, blue water cruisers, or certainly a boat like Esper, you've got quite deep cabinets either side. And so it, it sort of, you know, this impedes on the space in the middle of the boat. But in, in the feeling, there, were no, there was no storage. No, there's none at all. And storage is, uh, along with power, the two most talked about things on boats so you never have enough storage so you really need to be thinking very seriously about storage when you're looking at boats because if there is none you're going to have to be building it somehow. The other thing as well was the uh, how that boat would handle in heavy weather or how rather how you would handle walking down into the saloon in heavy weather it felt like there was a lot of space for you to be flung around in. Yes you need good grab handles we've got them all over the place you've got yeah. to, you've got to have something very solid to hold on to and I speak from experience having hit my head uh, in the heads on the way over from all along the Indian Ocean but yeah it's really important nice and solid something to hold on to but, but, but you, I mean but you get that it's not they're not all like that there are plenty of good um, production boats that are not like that. No, and I think really my point is is that when when you have one of those lighter displacement boats with a lot of room, perhaps it's not so important to have all these uh, 
things to hold on to in the storage space if you are just uh, coastal cruising, yeah. a day hopping or a weekend sailor. Because hopefully if you're doing that, you're checking the weather and you, so you're going out in conditions that suit you. Yes. You, know, you, you want nice wind, but you want nice flat seas. So as long as there's no fetch and swell coming through, you're having a great sail. Yes, but even if you do hit heavy weather, presumably you're only doing a 20 mile hop to your yeah. next anchorage or back to the marina where you're based. Yeah. So, uh, you know, you're going to be spending most of your time in the cockpit while you're actually sailing the boat. And then you'll be in the living quarters going down below and doing all your cooking when you're either safely at anchor or back in your marina at yeah. your base. Now, we do need to just talk about the difference in weight between a coastal cruiser and a blue water. So a coastal cruiser is much, much lighter and it will go faster. We get overtaken all the time when there's only a small amount of wind um, and we're just rumbling along, managing maybe four knots if we're lucky. But uh, friends of ours on lighter weight boats can just just take off, can't they? Yeah, I, I mean, this is this is, goes back to compromises. Yeah. You know, it's, this is and this is a major compromise uh, with sailed in, uh, you know, with other people and as you say often we're at the back of the, we are. At the fleet aren't we at the rally but when the wind's coming at us and it's bad weather we often take off because with the cutter rig we really sail to windward very very well and we can get some nice speeds up and because mm. she's heavy those we're not skittish and she just goes straight through the waves. I so. think that and that's the that's the yeah. the key word is skittish because on a lighter boat when you hit bigger waves you're going to be sort of bouncing over the top of them whereas on a heavier boat you're going to be more likely to be ploughing through those waves and it will feel more comfortable so, even if it's a little bit slower. Yeah so the keel is important so we've got a deep keel and she's heavy whereas the lighter boats tend not to do that they they do compensate sometimes by putting a bulb on the bottom. If you find this topic interesting and would like to continue the conversation, come and join the Follow the Boat Discord community. Look for the link in the description. It's free. Blue water cruisers tend to have an encapsulated keel, which is generally regarded as being a lot safer than the alternative, which is the bolt-on keel. Yes. And if your boat that you're looking at has a bolt-on keel, you need to be aware of the keel bolts, which you should be able to access from the bilges. And uh, this is um, obviously it's not in terms of safety, it's not perhaps quite as strong as an encapsulated kill. There's nothing wrong with it. Lots of boats out there with bolt on kills, but uh, just be aware of that. And lighter boats tend to have a bulb kill, which which gets that weight on a very thin kill yeah. uh, at the bottom of, yeah. of the kill itself. Yeah. So the other thing is um, with, with when I say deep kill, ours is seven feet, isn't it? So it's mm. two, over two metres. My point is about the depth. Yes. So we are deep um, and we haven't found it a hindrance. There's, I don't think there's anywhere we've not been able to sail, but we do know that it can be a problem for some people. Yeah, it is definitely worth bearing in mind that in some anchorages, and again, this is where you're going to have to do your research, you may have a problem trying to get in if you're, say, over two metres draft, so mm. two metres under the water. Uh, but for us so far, it's never been an issue. But, you know, there are the odd places around the world. I know, I know there are certain parts of the Caribbean, for example, where it can be quite shallow and you may not be able to get into certain anchorages. But as you say, it's it's not really been a problem for us. It so hasn't far. been a problem for us. The Caribbean is notorious. I think what they have there is a problem. They can't actually get into the atoll area. So mm -hmm. once you're in, so we often anchor quite a way out anyway. We don't like to be too close if we have that opportunity. We like to be away from the other boats and have plenty of swinging room. And then we, we have a good tender to get us ashore. But if you can't even get into that atoll in the first place, then you, you're screwed. So do look very much mm -hmm. if you're a uh, going to be cruising somewhere that's shallow. Yes, and I, I think that that really applies to coastal cruisers based in one particular location. Yes. If you're circumnavigating, I have to say, I don't think that's a problem. No, it isn't. What about bilge keels? Yes. Um... So we have a friend who's got a 60 foot steel bilge <laughs> keeler and uh, he bought it specifically for surfing and getting to difficult to get to surf spots, so effectively behind the wave where he can anchor and jump off his boat on his board. And the advantage of the bilge keeler is that he doesn't have to go into marinas. He can beach his, his boat at mid-tide, uh, wait for the tide to drop, and then he's got a good six hours or so to inspect under the hull. Yeah. Uh, he could even anti-foul as well if he really wanted to. It's a great boat for getting in and behind everything where we wouldn't even consider going. Um, and that's what he needs for his surfing, which is his 
that's his greatest love. Yeah. But you, I mean, they're very popular on the UK coast, actually, because where you have deep mm. tides, quite often you'll at low water, you will see a lot of boats that are just sitting quite happily in the mud. And then quite often, most often will be a bilge keeler. There are disadvantages, of course, uh, in terms of its performance. Uh, pointing to wind, I don't think is, is as good. Uh, but that's something you, you'd have to decide on, you know, what's more important. And perhaps you are based somewhere where you're not going to be in a marina, but you could be. Uh, leaving it to dry when the water drops. Yeah, um, it's not the kind of boat I'd want to cross an ocean on. I, what do you think? I couldn't comment on that. Don't, uh, no, don't you I, think I, they're too shallow? I don't, yeah, I know. I, I don't, don't know. I don't, anyway, don't. not quite sure about that one. Build skills is not something we've got much that's, experience that's the, of. that's the problem. We we don't have that much experience of them, and I think on the whole they're not as common as your standard fin kill boats mm. or your bowl kill boats anyway. Mm. Uh, but uh, do some research on that and come back to us. Let perhaps you can let us know in the yeah, comments. Yes, yeah. oh, yes. Must mention catamarans because they're fantastic cru cru uh, cruising boats, aren't they? Particularly for coasts. I'd you know if you've got the money, catamarans might be a good choice. Absolutely. I, I, and I, I think uh, they're suitable, especially to families where perhaps yeah. you've got children that need to run around. So they need that extra space. Nice and stable, you know, not too scary. They don't they don't go left and right. They tend to be flatter. So particularly for new people, we found a lot of um, and new sailors we've met with catamarans. They weren't very common when we started, but they're getting a little bit more common these days. Um, yeah, so I think Coastal cruising we've covered, haven't we? And I think hopefully people are understanding that if that's the kind of cruising you're planning to do, and it's very different to blue water, and you've got perhaps a wider scope, um, catamarans go faster as well. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they go a lot faster yeah. than monohulls. On, 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 on the whole, we're, to we're talking about uh, sort of liverpool boats here. We're not talking about racing boats. No. Uh, but yes, I would say on the whole, the catamarans definitely go a lot faster. Yeah, yeah. If that's your bag, if that's important to you, then maybe look at that. No, there, but there are um, other advantages as well with the catamaran in terms of, say, ongoing running costs. This sounds counterintuitive, but a catamaran has a very simple rig. Mm. One mast and three four cables mm. now if you compare that to an over rigged what like it, an over rigged boat a blue water cruiser which has a lot more cabling um, that's obviously one area where catamaran is going to be cheaper in terms of its running costs mm. cats however do tend to have two engines so you've got double the headaches with when it comes to engines um, um, maybe the shaft as well, props, that kind of thing. So, you know, again, once again, it is a compromise. Yes, and perhaps there's a good ch uh, point to, to make is about the deck space. So on blue water, you can always tell a blue water cruiser, because like us, they have got jerry cans all around the deck. They've got as much rigging as they can for safety to keep their mast or two masts like we are. Um, we've got a uh, cutter rig, so we've got an amazing amount of hardware on the deck haven't we and not a huge amount of area to sunbathe there's one bit at the back so if you've got a guest and watch the sunbathe they can go out there yes <laughs> when did you last sunbathe oh, years never <laughs> not something i like doing it's too hot yeah i mean and this is one reason why we ended up putting davits on the back of the boat yeah. it's somewhere to put the dinghy safely now quite often you'll see people will, you know they're able to put their dinghy on the foredeck it's a little bit of a hassle, mm. but, um, you know, it, it can be done, and especially for doing longer crossings, it's somewhere safe to put the dinghy. Unfortunately, we can't do that because we have this extra rigging taking up that valuable real estate on the boat. Mm. So that's why we have the davits at the back of mm. the boat. So if you're coastal cruising, you don't need all that stuff on the boat and you will have a cleaner looking boat and perhaps a bit more room for all your friends and family to sit around and sunbathe and read books and do whatever it is they want to do. <laughs> anything else i can't think of anything else on uh, coastal cruising if you can comparing coastal with blue water put a comment very interested to hear what you've got to say on it um then you need to think also about when we're talking about where you're going to sail are you going to be majority of the time marina based or are you going to be anchoring because that's going to affect things as well isn't it yeah i think that the biggest impact that's going to have is on your fuel consumption and storage 
and also your power as well. So if you're based in a marina, you will probably never need jerry cans because the amount of fuel you carry, I mean, let's face it, we can, we can do a fair few hundred miles just on what we carry uh, internally on the boat. The jerry cans are for doing the longer passages when we have to motor. Whereas if you're based in a marina and you're only going out for the day, you won't need to have those extra jerry cans. Yeah, you need them around here in Indonesia because there, there are very few places where you can actually tie up. There's hardly any marinas here. So you, if you come to Indonesia, be prepared to be anchored pretty much all of the time. Mm. So finding that um, diesel or petrol, whatever it is, uh, it's possible and it's easy to do, but you've got to be lugging it backwards and forwards. So you need to be carrying as much as you can on the boat, which is why we have jerry cans all around the boat. And then the other thing is, uh, as you say, is power. Mm. You're not tied on, you're not plugged in. So you need to be making your power. Yeah, that's that's the other thing. Obviously, we have uh, a lot of solar panels because we spend pretty much all our time, 99% of our time at anchor. So we're making our own power. If you are based in a marina, again, this may not be an issue. Perhaps you're only going out for the weekend. You have enough battery capacity to see you through with maybe one small solar panel just to keep things ticking over. When you start being more remote, you have to think about these extra systems like uh, a much better battery management system and uh, what else? Well, just ways of more, making. Yeah, more efficiency and um, yes, how you, how you actually make the power. Yes, I mean, some people have wind generators. It's not something we have. We've looked at it in the past, but as many solar panels and the most efficient solar panels as you can, you can put those on. This is if you're going to be anchoring particularly remote or for long times. And the other thing you've got to think about is water. Mm -hmm. If you're in a marina or you're tied on somewhere for most of the time and you're perhaps going out and you're sailing two or three weeks at a time, you probably don't need a water maker. If you've got a decent sized tank of water, you don't need a water maker. But we couldn't exist without one. We got one in the med and we haven't looked back. Funnily enough, I was having a conversation with someone recently about water makers. They're, they're actually currently in the process of kitting out their boat. And someone had told them in Indonesia, it's easy to get the 20 litre plastic water bottles, take them to your boat and fill up your tanks. You can do that anywhere in the world. Which is true, but you've got to lug those jerry cans <laughs> to the boat and decant them. And if you are doing that every few weeks, it's bad enough just doing fuel, but to do water as well. So that is another consideration. Um, to give you a rough idea, we carry 650 litres of water on the boat. And if we weren't making water, that would probably last us approximately three to five weeks, depending on... Days, how... I was going to say. <laughs> no, it depends yeah. on how frugal we are and how much we shower, of course, yeah. as well. So, yes, a water maker could be something that if you're lucky, you may find on the boat you're looking at. Did you know that liking and subscribing on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts helps us to get noticed? Go on, give us a helping hand. Final word on where you're going to be sailing is the weather. Uh, sounds obvious, but you do need to know about the weather in the area that you've got up your sleeve. Is it going to be hot? Is it going to be tropical? Is it going to be cold? Are you going to be in the Arctic? All of those things are going to affect the type of boat you get. Yeah, now this brings us nicely into wooden decks. Yes. We all love wooden decks. They look great, don't they? And You'll find a lot of wooden deck boats were probably manufactured in the Northern Hemisphere, Scandinavia, uh, Western Europe, uh, because it acts as great insulation. However, when you move to the tropics where the average air temperature is between 25 and 30 degrees, you will find those wooden decks insufferable. So you might want to think about that, your longer term plans, where you're going to spend a lot of your time. Just be aware that uh, that could impact that. But of course, if you're based in the Northern Hemisphere and you're going to be spending quite a bit of your time uh, during cold winter months, then perhaps the wooden deck, the teak decks are going to be useful. Yeah, as a, as a matter of interest, we bought Esper with a wooden deck and when we got here, we took the deck off. It was going to be replaced or, or removed and we removed it and we immediately got cooler below. And we saw other boats, I mean, big oysters, really smart looking boats that have done the same. They've taken their wooden decks off. So if you know you're going to be in hot places only, then uh, do consider the deck. It's quite an important um, aspect of buying a boat. Then the other thing about weather, um, if it's going to be hot, 
do you need AC? And if it's going to be cold, you will need heating. So that's something to consider as well. Okay, I'll answer, I'll answer <laughs> that because I would say if you're going to be hot, no, you don't need AC. Yeah. Uh, if you're going to be spending most of your time at anchor because the boat, when at anchor, tends to point into the wind. So you will almost always have a through breeze coming through the boat. The second thing is, is that if you're from a colder climate, you will eventually acclimatise to the tropical weather. You'll continue to be a sweaty <laughs> bastard like me, but you, you do get used to it. And we've never felt a need for AC while we're at anchor on the boat. It's a different story if you're in a marina, especially if you're hauled out and you don't have the insulation of the water. It can get very hot on the boat. Uh, but for AC, I would say that's less of a, an issue. Heating, though, in colder places is yeah. is essential, yeah. if for no other reason than to um, keep away the uh, condensation mm -hmm. that, you, that you get in the cold winter months, mm -hmm. uh, just to keep the boat dry. You might even be wanting to look at a dehumidifier, but, you know, you can buy those units separately. We used, so. we used, that, we used one yeah. in Turkey, didn't I we, in, in the winter? I think when you're looking for a boat, a de an installed dehumidifier <laughs> well, isn't something that you tend to think about. But an Ebersbacca or a Basto type heating system might be uh, something that you do need to consider if you're going to be up north or deeply south, anywhere cold. There's nothing worse than being on a boat and being cold. You really mm. need to be warm. So think about the temperature. If it, Just want to yeah. say, if you are looking at a boat to take to colder climates, the other thing you need to be aware of is insulating the boat. So it is worth looking at the boat to see if it has already been insulated. Mm. Yes. So just bear that in mind. And then the other thing with weather, of course, is that it strangely affects your storage because if, you've, if you're in a hot place, you really don't need any boots or shoes. We just have flip-flops and uh, fins. And we just have a few t-shirts and shorts. So there's, when we got here, we just freed up so much storage space on the boat because when you're in a cold place, you need hats and scarves and gloves and big bulky jackets and proper Arctic gear when it gets in the winter. Big jumpers and, and trousers and socks and all those things. And they don't half take up a lot of room. Yeah, well, I remember when we started in Turkey, although it's generally a hot country mm. during the summer months, in the winter it did get cold and we were wearing socks, shoes, jeans, and I remember woolen jumpers yes. and thick coats. Thermals, all of that stuff. And when we moved to the tropics, we got rid of all that stuff. And, it, and you're right, it freed up so much space. Yes, it's now full of all your camera gear, but uh, it does free up the space. So it, Think of those things. So that's that's the first question you need to ask yourself. Get all that down on paper and work out what it is you want, where you're going to be going and what that's going to mean. So the second one was who will you be sailing with? That seems like an odd question, but it's important. I think it's very important. Uh, we've got solo sailors, couples like us, families, uh, friends visiting frequently, Th these are going to have some kind of impact on the kind of boat you want. In fact, there's a conversation on our Discord channel happening right now mm. uh, where someone is asking about tenders because he envisaged, he hasn't bought his boat yet, but he plans to have lots of friends coming over. So he wants to look at his tender and to find out if he can get one that will allow him to do a lot of carting of people backwards. And he, wants to, he wants to get seven people in the tender with him. So that's a big tender. I'd suggest get a smaller one that's going to fit the boat and just do two runs. It, you can you can get you. seven people in a tender. It just yeah. might be a very wet ride. They can't take into their luggage. <laughs> they can put it on their head. But yeah, so a family of four. Um, or five. Or five, or however many there are of you. You need to consider where they're all going to be on the boat if you're living on it, because everyone's going to need their own cabin. They really are. Even the children, small children, sharing isn't always great, good for them, particularly as they get older and become teenagers. They need their space. Um, a solar sailor, of course, can, I, can have a great big boat and have loads of space. Mm. Could build a dark room like you'd like to do, could have a little cinema, <laughs> just all of those things. Um, yeah. Decent spare cabin. When we first bought Esper, we had a double cabin at the front. Our main one is at the stern. And then we had two uh, bunks as well. And we had lots of people coming to stay with us because we were in the Mediterranean and home for us is England. So people were able to come over and visit quite regularly. And we used those quite a lot. As we've got further afield, fewer guests, 
also more crap on the boat. So those areas have become storage now. I was going to say just fewer friends, generally. <laughs> <laughs> All of my friends grew up and had children, so they stopped coming to visit. And we're that much further away now. Oh, so, and, and this is an important consideration, perhaps your longer term plans where you eventually end up taking the boat. How important is it going to be to have all this this extra cabin space for visiting friends it may not be so relevant we realized but, it was a luxury didn't we but i think your point about not just children but everyone having their own personal mm. space is really important but especially for children they do need to have their own space mm. even if it is just a bunk it's mm. just somewhere that they can escape from the rest of the family as we all like to do to, from time to time somewhere to put up their little posters yes. and pictures and store all their personal effects. Yes. And if you have a paid member of crew, you can't be expecting them to be sleeping in the saloon and changing their bed linen every night and putting everything away, can you? Yeah, if they're crew, that's crew will sleep anywhere. I suppose so. Uh, but if they're paid crew, I don't know, they would expect a modicum of comfort. I would have thought so. But I think most crew, and by crew let's define these as people that aren't family or friends but are literally just helping you sail your boat, they'll sleep anywhere. Okay. Um, but, but that's still an important consideration. If you're going to be doing that regularly and your saloon um, bench doubles up as a, as a place for your crew to stay, um, do you want to be dealing with making and unmaking that bed every day? Mm. Um, Certainly as a permanent member of crew, i.e. family, or the permanent member of crew, I wouldn't want to be doing that, could not do that. Uh, you need to talk to your family about whether they're prepared to do that if you don't think there's going to be enough room. But better, ensure when you buy the boat that there is enough room for everybody to sleep and have a space of their own. We do, we've got space of our own on Esper. Uh, I have a little area at the front of the boat on the port side that's my boffice where I boss Jamie around and do all my work. And Jamie uses the, the navigation sta uh, station as his area, has all his crap over there and does his stuff. And we're actually physically apart quite a, we can't it's, actually even see each other. It's great. <laughs> she can't even hear me. She's half deaf. Yeah. But uh, not being able to see Liz is, uh, for a few <laughs> hours, is, it, it's, you know, can't, can't put a price on that. Yeah, we're joking, but we're, it's true. There's yeah. a modicum of truth. You do need to be able to get away from each other. So think very carefully about the layout and the space in terms of who you're going to have on the boat with you. Um, entertainers, you'll want a big cockpit won't you yeah i think that's true and this goes back to the coastal yeah. lightweight boats versus blue water cruisers if you are going to spend most of your time with family and friends visiting then perhaps you want to put more emphasis on the cockpit yeah as you as you said earlier you know we can literally seat four people in our cockpit it's yeah. not the cockpit for entertaining lots of people it can be done and we have done it but if you want some kind of comfort then you know a large aft cockpit is perhaps more important to you than an aft cabin for example yeah. because that's the compromise with having a big large aft cockpit is not having a large aft cabin yes which was pretty high up on our list of, of things yeah we haven't actually talked about that have we about where the cabin should be but uh, it, it is something you do need to think very seriously about. We'll come on to that. We are assuming it's going to be hot. And if, if it's cold, you're going to need a lot of space below. So when we first got the boat uh, in the winters in Turkey, we, um, we, had the, we have a table that we don't really use now. But we had a big table that folded out. We could seat eight people down below. Oh, easily, yeah. So she was designed not for, for cockpit entertaining because she's a northern hemisphere boat. She was boat designed to be entertaining below a lot of oysters are like that they have beautiful areas down below great big areas for entertaining don't they so yeah if you're going to be north america or europe then um, look at the space you've got below and see how many people you can get around the table there and how many people you want down there well, well i think we'll talk a little bit more about layout in part two yes we? i think so yes yeah. um the other thing to think about if there's a, there's a few of you on the boat, is one head's going to be enough? Mm. Yes, we started off with two heads and it was useful when we had guests. Uh, but uh, we realised that 99% of our time on the boat is just us two. And a second head was, it was unnecessary for us. But more to the point, 
it would free up space to become what is now Lizzie's boffice. But at the front of the boat, we had a separate shower and a mm. toilet there. Yes, yeah, completely unnecessary, over the top for us. For just two of you, you really don't need more than one head, I'd suggest, definitely. Mm. Uh, and so think about how, what you could do with that extra space. If you are enjoying this podcast, more importantly, if you're finding the information in it useful, then do please consider becoming an FTB mate, which will give you access to part two of this podcast right now. It's not something we really go on about this funding business anymore, is it? We don't don't like to go on about it too much but essentially we are supported by our viewers yeah they're great we love them and uh, we've had some people with us for a very long time now so we should take this opportunity to thank all of them who make these podcasts and our episodes possible thank you guys thank you sorry for interrupting but while i've got you here if you like what we do and you want to support us and become a patreon or join us on ftb mates or even drop a quid in the rum fund go to followtheboat.com forward slash pub of course come to the pub something else to consider if you're buying a boat is will you be working remotely in the last few years this has really mushroomed this idea that you don't need to work in an office you can work from home and if you can work from home that means you can work from anywhere in the world so lots of people are backpacking and working remotely also they are living on boats and working remotely something you need to consider yeah i mean the internet connection we've seen internet connection go from nothing think of turkey we had no internet connection when we were on the coast coastal cruising and anchoring places now it's everywhere i mean indonesia pretty much everywhere we've been in indonesia has internet connection and this does provide a great opportunity for you to work from home but you need your own space to do that now it could just be the chart table where you flip up your laptop Um, But I think you like to think that it should be more permanent, a dedicated space. I really do. I think if you're, you know, if you're a working full time person on a boat, you need somewhere that is comfortable, that is your space and it's not going to be interfered with. It's not used as something else. So I would suggest that you try and find something that that works for you that way. For instance, my boffice area, I have to pack everything away when we want to put the water maker on because that's underneath the bench. So everything has to be taken out, put away, packed away, da 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 da, and then I have to bring it all out again to work in there. But if you're working full time, you're getting paid to work full time on your boat, then find somewhere, a nook, a cranny that is yours and remains yours and is permanently available to you. You can do this, by the way, as a blue water cruiser or a coastal cruiser. Obviously, while you're blue water cruising, if you're going across an ocean, no work, that's going to be your holiday. That's when you're going to do two or three weeks when you're non not contactable for the rest of the time, you could do this anywhere. Yeah, I'm just thinking one of uh, the users on our Discord channel, by the way, uh, he is a video editor and he owns a catamaran. He has his entire editing suite set up in his catamaran with multiple monitors. And uh, obviously catamaran having that much more room for that kind of thing. Uh, But it's it's a semi-permanent setup, but he is working from home, which is his catamaran. More and more people are doing it these days, so yeah. think about it. Think about the boat and how it's going to work for you if that's your plan. The next thing on other factors mm. is construction. Massive, oh, yes. massive thing to think about. The construction of your dream boat. Yes, now by construction, we're, we're talking about material that the uh, hull is made from, yeah? Yeah. So obviously we have GRP, which is uh, glass fibre, fibreglass, and uh, you'll find most most boats yeah. are made of fiberglass these days and it's easy to work with it's easy to repair you can pretty much do repairs anywhere in the world on a grp boat and of course the trade-off though is that you know if you hit a reef or a rock uh, the reef or rock is going to come up better off on, on that accident and you're likely to put a hole in your boat so that's obviously the downside of, of grp boats and environmentally you're actually in a great big piece of plastic yes. well, that's not good is it Maybe you shouldn't buy a new one. Just keep using, you know, recycling the old ones. Have to think about that. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, of course, you may have heard of osmosis. Uh, this is the plague that affects GRP boats when you get little osmotic bubbles in the hull. Water ingress gets in behind the gel coat. Um, this is more of a cosmetic issue, to be honest, than anything. Um, it, it, you know, it's treatable, you can deal with it. And uh, there's a lot of boats out there sailing with osmosis that uh, don't 
you know, they don't sink. No, they don't. It's not the bogey word that it used to be. Oh, osmosis, don't touch it. Not true at all. Um, it's easily dealt with. Perhaps the second most popular choice for boats in terms of construction would be steel. Nice and strong, of course. And the advantage is, again, you can work on steel from anywhere. Uh, well, and rather, most boat yards will accommodate you if you are a steel boat. And you'll, you'll find the labour, if you're not doing it yourselves, pretty much around the world. Of course, the great advantage is that it's, it's so strong that if you do hit a rock or reef, um, of the steel boat and the GRP boat, the steel boat is probably going to be uh, coming better off than the GRP boat, yeah. I would suspect. Loads of steel boats out there, fishing boats, so there's plenty of places where you, you get the work done on your steel boat. Yeah, I mean, but the disadvantage, however, yeah. is that uh, if it rusts, it rusts from the inside out. Mm -hmm. Now, this means that all of your cabin, cabinet work is has to be removable mm -hmm. and you need to be inspecting it regularly. So there are some downsides to it. Of course, there's also good steel and there's bad steel. So you need to find out where the boat was manufactured and what kind of steel was used. Mm. And also if it's had any mending, what steel was used. It may have been made somewhere where the steel was excellent, but it may have had some patches that are not so good. Yeah, good, good point. Yeah. yeah. Aluminium? Yeah, I mean, aluminium has all the advantages of GRP and steel. It's light and it's strong. Um, its main issue, of course, is electrolysis, which are runaway currents that can happen either on the boat or, more worryingly, in the water in a marina where yeah. perhaps you've got a, a leaking electrical cable in the water. This can affect aluminium and that's something that you need to be aware of and stay on top of. Yeah, so if you're confident about that kind of thing, if you're an electrician, <laughs> an aluminium boat, aluminium boat could be really good. They are, they are good boats. Orvany is one I can think of. Mm. Yeah, very good boats. I mean, other, other materials would include ferro-cement, which was really the preserve of uh, those who made their own boats in their back garden. Well, that was a bit mean, but yes, it used to be, <laughs> didn't they're, it? They're nice and strong, um, but, you know, they, 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 they can sink when they hit things. Yeah. So. And carbon fibre? Yeah, I think that's the preserve of racing boats. Yeah. I mean, there are, it's definitely, it's all about going fast in a carbon fibre boat, isn't it? But um, they, are, they are around if you've got lots of money. Uh, yes. Wood, bamboo, those. Beautiful, yeah. of course. Yes. But it's a labour of love. You've got to be on top of the woodwork all the time. The great thing is, of course, is that wooden boats cover most of the globe. Mm -hmm. All the boats that uh, are passing us now at this anchorage, they're all wood. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to be short of places to, to get repairs done, to find the skills to help you make those repairs. But there will be loads of maintenance to do and it's the thing that puts me off. I mean, what, what's great is that when you turn up in your beautiful wooden boat and you drop the hook, everybody's looking at your boat, you are going to be the most beautiful boat in the anchorage mm. most of the time. Imagine a J-class wooden boat turning up. Oh my God. I mean, they are stunning. So we all know maintenance is quite a big part of boat ownership anyway, but double it, treble it if you've got a wooden boat. Mm. You've, got to, you've got to be a carpenter, you've got to love it. Yeah. Uh, I guess we should talk about size. Yes. Does it matter, Liz? Does size matter? Oh, da, 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 dad joke. Does size matter? Well, yes, it does. In some respects, it does. Oh, that's a disappointing reply. <laughs> In fact, the reply is you probably don't need to go as big as you think. Mm. So if you watch YouTube channels and that's how you get all your information about boats, you may think that boats are a lot bigger out here than they actually are. But what we've seen in all the years we've been sailing is that most people like us, certainly couples, 40 to 45 foot seems to be the optimum size for a liverboard cruiser, I would say. Yeah, I mean, back in the day when Esper was built in the late 80s, 43 foot was actually quite a luxurious, uh, <laughs> large cruising boat. People told us not to buy it. They said it's too big for you. You're, you're beginners and you won't know how to handle it. I think due to the reduced costs of uh, materials, perhaps boats t have tended to get bigger on the whole. Uh, but, but you're right. Uh, most cruisers we know are in anything between the late 30s up to early 50s. So between 38 to 52 foot. 42. 52, uh, would you say? Yes. I don't think there's many 50 Oy foot Oyster's boats. most popular model was the 52. 
Um, but uh, so was the 435 before yes, that, of course. More. Yeah, more of those than anything. I mean, but oyster is a different kettle of fish. Yeah, a 52 yeah. for oyster, um, I think we're talking to 0.01% of yeah. the audience yeah, there. Yeah. Um, so disregard that. But certainly, I mean, you're talking, you know, we know lots of 46, 48 foot boats out there. Um, I'm thinking of still Sapphire. This was 49. Yes, yeah, so you know. she was a big boat in an anchorage. So, she was. so I'm just I'm going from what we've seen. I'd say 50 foot. You're right at the. You're upper starting end. to get to that. Yes, yeah. that's right. Yeah. So you don't need anything over 50 foot, unless you really want it. You actually don't need it. A 45 foot boat is great. Does the job, especially if you're just a couple. There's loads of room for everything. Well, I, th I think of course the other problem is is that the bigger the boat. Generally, the bigger the sails, the more the forces you're going to be, have to be dealing with in heavier weather. So if there are just two of you, when you start hitting 50 foot and above, things can start to get unmanageable unless everything is hydraulic and push button. Yeah, so if you've, if you've got a sloop with a big main and a huge genoa and there's just two of you as a couple, that can be a lot to manage, mm. which is where catches come in because you've got smaller sails a bit easier for you to manage. Much, much easier to manage. Yeah. yeah. The other downside with a large boat, of course, is that you're going to be paying a lot more in a marina. Sometimes you can't haul out because you're too big. You wouldn't be able to haul out over here. But I just wanted to address that. I, yeah, I was watching a video the other day. Someone said that actually the difference between a 36 foot and a 48 foot or something, 43 foot, the difference in marina cost is negligible. Right. I don't know how true that is, though. Because... Well, it is per foot, so it depends on your budget. I well, that, this is it. I mean, it's relative, isn't it? Uh, yeah. you, one assumes perhaps your budget is tighter if you're on a 36-foot boat versus yeah. someone that's on a 43-foot boat. So depending on your viewpoint, it may be negligible to you, but the difference to the person owning that 36-foot foot boat could be quite significant it can and some places they sort of don't do it by the foot they put them in groups so if you're below 40 foot you're in the lower That's you're, true. you're in the lower group um yeah you do have to think about those those costs that are going to occur in marinas and hauling out and whether you can be hauled out catamarans as well catamarans sometimes one and a half even twice the amount for the length in marinas because you're taking up two berths they charge you for two berths you can't haul out in indonesia in boats that are too big and too heavy anywhere yes uh, that, that is something to be aware of yeah. uh, i was having a conversation with someone that wants to buy a trimaran mm. and they were asking the question well wh where can i take it in the world or where can't i go and it I can't really answer that question you need to go away and look at where you think you're going to be based uh, if you perhaps have to do emergency repairs and need to haul out at the only boatyard that happens to be two miles up a mangrove uh, swamp, uh, perhaps you can't get your trimaran up there because it's too wide. There's plenty of places we've been where you would not be able to get a big trimaran. Mm. There is a small trimaran that we know of and they managed to haul out, but I can't remember the size. It's a small boat. Yeah, but I, I think in terms of this increase in cost as you go up in length, it's definitely relevant when it comes to onboard things like rigging, yeah. sails, electrics, um, plumbing, those kind of things get exponentially more expensive to service and replace. Yeah. Uh, so that is something to bear in mind. Yeah. You may be able to afford to buy yourself a 52 foot boat, but do you have the budget to run it? To run it. Yeah. Yeah. OK, so that's that size. It's a personal choice. Just saying from our experience, don't go as big as you think you need to. <laughs> That's your advice. That's my advice. My advice is get the biggest boat possible. <laughs> you could get a great big flappy useless boat or a smaller, really smart, fast, delicious performer, boat. Yeah. Yes. So before we finish on part one, we've gone on for long enough. You can see why we've had to do part one and part two. A word on experience. Now we're mm. assuming if you're watching this that you are new, not necessarily to sailing, but certainly to cruising and living on a boat. You need to think very hard about that. If you aren't new to sailing, you've got some advice, haven't you? Uh, have I got some advice? <laughs> yes, um, if you're new to sailing. Uh, oh, right. You, you mean get experience? Yes. Yeah, that's the most important thing, I think, is uh, do you even 
you might find that you love this idea when you watch the YouTube channels and you love it on paper, but you step on board a boat and find you start throwing up as soon as the boat just does this. So uh, just go out and get some experience, uh, which will also expose you to different boat layouts as yeah. well. It's hugely important. You need to go and look at boats. We'll talk a lot about that in the next one. But you're saying you've got to be sure that this life is what you want and it's nothing like what you see on the YouTube channels. You're seeing what, 20 minutes a week of all the highlights. There's an awful lot of stuff you're not seeing. You need to get on it. Also, if you're a family, you need to get the rest of the family on, make sure that they are all on board, mm. that they are up for the idea as well. It's a lovely, lovely dream, but we've seen so many people start the dream and then fail and go sell up and go home which is good for you if you're buying, because it means there are boats out there that you can buy. But yeah, you've got to be really, really sure. So get loads and loads of experience. Join a yacht club, crew for as many boats as you can, go on for the tiller holidays with the family, do all of that. Just get it out of your system so you know that this is what, this is the life for you, I'd say. Uh, actually, uh, delivering boats, which is what I did, also yeah. exposes you to different skippers <laughs> who have different ways of doing things. And it's a great way of learning skills. Mm. That could be sail trim, it could be how you manage watches, uh, how you organise the galley. Uh, but again, if you get more experience sailing with lots of different types of crew and skippers, uh, this is only going to help you when eventually you do buy your boat and move on to your own boat. A good way of doing that is to, uh, I only know about the UK, the RYA, Royal Yachting Association, runs a whole load of courses from the basic competent crew we spend a week on the boat with a whole load of strangers and learn how to run a boat, basically as a, as a crew member, right up to the yacht master. And you, you're always meeting lots of new people in new, in, in new situations. That's a really good way to learn about this life. So, I think that this area is quite an important topic mm. because we're not just talking about buying the actual boat itself. We're, we are talking about buying into a lifestyle. Yeah. A liver, liverboard cruising is a lifestyle change. Yes. So these kind of things, how you get on with other people while on board, how you get on with your wife or yeah. husband or boyfriend, girlfriend, these are very important and will affect A, the type of boat you do, B, the type of cruising you do, and most importantly, C, it will affect your relationship. Yes, that's that. whether it's positively or negatively is up to you. <laughs> if you've been uh, living in a you know camper van, if you've been traveling a lot already in a camper van, I would suggest the switch from van to boat is really good. Now, there's Gone with the Winds. They're a great example. They've done years together in a camper van and they've moved from land to sea. So a lot of that had all they'd already got used mm. to. So it was just the actual learning the skills of the sailing, which, to be honest, isn't that difficult. Yeah, the sailing bit's the easy yeah, bit. We easy. always say that. Sailing is easy. Yeah, yeah. It's everything else that's a little bit more complex. Yeah. So maybe if you can't get onto a boat, get a camper van and go on holiday for two weeks with the family and see how you all get on. Not, not allowing them off, <laughs> keeping them inside for two weeks. So, yeah. So I think that's the last thing we're going to talk about in part one, which is get the experience, make sure that this is what you want to do. In part two, we're going to talk about how to buy it, um, what you need to look for, what, working out your budget and what you need to do with that. Yep. OK, so if you are an FTB mate, you can jump straight in and watch the next episode right now. If you're not, then don't forget, please join us on FTB Mates and you get to see this. Otherwise, you've got to wait two weeks. Yeah. But we are going to now record the second bit right now. <laughs> Peace and fair winds for now. See you in part two.